This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. It's a real tremendous chus to be here, coming from America, to come and sit and steig and learn. It's really a tremendous chus. And the topic that was given to me was the topic of Simcha Sachayim. I'd like to explain Be'ez Hashem a little bit. Perhaps, particularly this week, we can speak a little bit about the Indian of Shira, Parshas Bishalach, and how much Simcha we have in our own lives that perhaps needs to be pinpointed. The Torah tells us this week, Parshas Bishalach, Peret Tezvov, Posukhoch, Vatikach, Miriam, Anavia, Achis Aaron, Esat Toif, Biyoda. We know that Miriam took the drum, some kind of instrument in her hand, and there was music going on at the time. Very interesting. But it seems to be that the simcha that was displayed by the women, by the Shira, in the time when Klal Yisrael left Mitzrayim, that wonderful time that Klal Yisrael left, and they left finally the slavery of Mitzrayim, they were able to be free, they were on their way to Kabbalah Satayra. I hear the singing Shira. But yet it seems to be that Miriam, with, together with all the Nashim, the women, seem to be developing much more of a simcha than the men. After all, the men are singing Shira, which is wonderful. But Miriam doesn't just sing. The women are not just singing, they're taking musical instruments. It's a good, it's a chido that says maybe they're doing it to drown out their voices because of shailas of women singing. But Poshib Shat, what's going on? So Chaim Zayshik Zatzal explains to as follows. He says that it, perhaps we can maybe suggest that the women had much more of a sense of a chorus much more of a simcha, because they realized how bad it was in Mitzrayim. Well, how the Mitzrayim treated the women with everything that was going on in Yonah Iznus was so bad that when they finally came out, the women understood what it was like to be there and what it was like to be free. And therefore they were able to express their Akkaris HaToyv and they were able to express their Simcha, perhaps even more than the men. Which is an amazing, amazing thing, which again, has to be highlighted specifically now, but in all times. Were the women part of the Shiva and the Why not? They were treated badly. They worked hard, but they were treated badly. They were not part of the shibud. No, not the shibud. They, they were tre- went out to the fields. They Correct, but they were treated very badly by the mitzvah. They were subjugated to terrible things with all the nyonis nus going on over there. They were not part of the nus, obviously, but they were a chalik of what was going on in Mitzrayim. They might have been a chalik of the shibud, but there was definitely something going on. And again, they expressed that akoris satoy, that simcha, when they left. There's a moedic of from the Kotzka. I, I don't know how, I would never say such a thing. If not, I saw it in the safe from the Kotzka. The Kotzka Rebbe writes, a few psukim after we just quoted, an unbelievable, unbelievable thing, a pasuk at Gimel. Says the Kotzka, they weren't able to drink the water. Okay, we're not going to go into the whole sugi, see Rashi. Mimara, kimorim heim, bitter, bitter water. So the Velt says, and Poshup Shad over here, bitter water means that the water was bitter, and because the water was bitter, we're not able to drink from the water. Says the Koska, that's not Pshat. Says the Koska, you know what Pshat is? They were bitter. They were bitter themselves, and when you're bitter yourselves, you're not able to drink from the water, says the Koska, an amazing thing. And this concept applies to so many areas in our own lives. If a person is looking for faults, if a person is looking for the negativity in life, he'll, he'll always find it. It's always going to be there. He'll always find it if he's looking for it. But someone that's looking for the positivity, for the simcha, for the gifts that he was given by the Rabbi Nishlan, he'll also find it. It all depends on your perspective. It says the Kotzka here, by the Shira, Klali saw in a situation where they were moaning, there was a bitterness, were made, they felt the water was bitter also, and they weren't able to take from it. It's an amazing, amazing insight. And I want to bring this out in a very important akuda because I, I've spoken about this so many times. And I see this on people I worked, Baruch Hashem, I've had the discourse of working with boys and also for different seminaries and girls as well for years. And I hear this so many times from the generations as they're getting distant and more distant from Kabbalah Satoya, this negativity, the constant never appreciating and realizing what we have. We know the Torah tells us in Parshish Kisavai, 
Samachta Bukhala Taif, Ms. Arachaima Kodish, or Shishiva of Shaim of Khan Pim Khashaim is at Sal, always you talk about the Rachaima Kodish, Samachta Bukhala Taif, the Taif is Aim Taiva La Taiva, Taif is the biggest simch in a person's life, and as the Rachaima Kodish points out, and as I'm sure you're experiencing here in Yushalayim, that if a person experiences and really, really delves into the Torah, the simcha that he gets is something that's unparalleled. It's something that just gives a person re-energy. And I'm sure Mitzvah Shem, when you go back to America, you're going to have that re-energy, recharge the batteries to continue steiging and learning in America also. But there's an unbelievable thing. There's a Mishnah in Bikurim Perigimel. And the Mishnah, if we've learned the Mishnah, yes, it's very interesting how the Mishnah describes the ceremony, the whole procedure of what was going on in the Beis HaMikdash at the time when they brought the Bikurim. And the Mishnah goes into so many details describing how the farmers came in with their Bikurim, with the beautiful baskets, and each one brought the beautiful fruits that their field has, had, 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 you know, had grown. And it was absolutely amazing. It's really, really a beautiful thing. The farmers came from all over Eretz Yisrael. Everybody packed on the streets. You can understand. You can realize. As you're here in Yerushalayim, you can see. Just imagine the farmers. Everyone is walking up to the Beis Hamidrash with a beautiful basket full of luscious, gorgeous fruit. It's an, you can imagine the experience. Imagine the simcha that was just palpable on the streets. It was amazing. That was what was going on. Not only that, says Chazal, again, you look at the Mishnahis. There was music being played on the streets. People were dancing. It was an atmosphere. It was just amazing here in Yushalayim. You have, for example, an Arab Yom Tov. You have so many different situations where you feel the Yom Tov. You feel what's going on. That was what's happening by Bikurim. By Bikurim, the whole day was a day of simcha. It was a day of joy. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing thing. Asks Rav Gifta the following question. If it was such a simcha, there was so much happiness. There's so much going on. Why did the Torah have to say the Samachta Bukhala Toiv? Rejoice in all the good that you have. It's a simcha. It's beautiful. It's great. Everyone's having a good time. Everyone's seeing the fruits. Everyone's seeing everyone going out to make some Middash. What do you, you need to be instructed to go have a to be a simcha? What's the chat? Says of Gifta. The understanding from here is something which is a life-changing attitude to our lives. And if we implement this in our lives, and again, I've, I've spoken so many times because I believe it so much. If we implement this in our own lives, our lives will be happier. We're looking for the recipe. Simcha Sachain. What is it that gives us happiness? What is it that gives a person simcha? Says Rav Gitta Zatzal, Poshib Shat. The atmosphere cannot give you simcha. The atmosphere can be an atmosphere of simcha. The atmosphere can be amazing. It can be great. But if you're not the simcha, if it's the attitude that's going or that's behind it, it's you that has to change. It's you that has to have a somachta b'chol The atmosphere around you is very nice. It can add. It can help. But that's not going to make you happy. The Chayv Salavovus writes in the Akdoma, in Shara Bechina, he says, and he understands, and he explains why. What's the pshat in this Nakuda? Says the Chaybis of Ovis, it's not our fault. We have a Yetzirah, we have inside an inclination that's always pushing for more. And not only is it pushing for more, but it tells us in a subtle way, under the carpet, you're not going to be happy until you get more. It's a chazal, Pasuk Ka'elis, Gemara Makas, we're all familiar. Right? Mishayesh Leimonam, Matzavis Masayim, Mishu Rabbeinu. As the Gemara points out, everybody wants more. And the truth is, we're living in a generation with advertising that's unbelievably good in this. You know, they have a picture of the latest phone. And the phone will be, you know, I look at it and I think, well, I don't know, I also have kind of that phone. Maybe it's one of the couple models earlier. But it makes it show as if, well, if you don't have this phone, you're just not going to be happy. And you're just not going to be happy until you have the latest model. You know, it doesn't even have to talk about a phone, talk about Diet Coke. They don't just show you a can of Diet Coke. They're showing you a Diet Coke, it's freezing cold, and it's boiling hot outside, and you look at it, and all of a sudden, mm, I'm a bit thirsty now, I was fine a minute ago, but right now I'm a bit thirsty. But that's what advertising does. You're not happy until you get this, and it never ends. It's chazal, it's chazal. Says the Chayvus Olives, that's the pshat. A person is automatically blind to what he has, because he's always looking on the outside. By the Bikurim, the farmers had such beautiful fruits, they could do baskets, it was great. But they're looking, oh, one second, wow, look at that guy. Look at he's got. He's got nicer fruit, he's got more of a selection, he's look greener, redder, whatever it may be. 
And then all of a sudden, you're not happy with what you have. It says, of gift is that soul, that's the aside of simcha in life. The aside of simcha in life. If a person wants to know what's the recipe for a happy life, and everybody wants a happy life. And you have people that, you know, they'll go to all lengths to get happiness. You know, I've got Talmidim from years ago, one or two of them, thank you, Shkrech, one or two of them, that whatever, well, maybe so much slirch in the system, they went to India, because over there I'm going to be happy. If I'm not happy here, I'm going to be happy over there. And the answer is, and I try to tell them this, if that's your attitude, if that's your perspective in life, you'll never be happy, because you're looking for the happiness, but it's right in front of your face, and you don't even realize it. And the reason is, because often we don't appreciate that which we have. We don't appreciate all the wonderful gifts that the Rabbani Shalom gives us. In the psychology books, they call it the missing tile syndrome. The missing tile syndrome means that when you walk into a room, it could be a gorgeous room, it's great, but there's one tile missing. And a guy walks in, and the first thing he says, hey, there's a tile missing in the ceiling. Well, one second. You look at the beautiful decor of the room. Everything's nicely lit up. It's warm. It's nice to the eye. There's the wood and there's the cream color and the curtains and the window. It's beautiful. You had to notice that. The answer is, because if a person's perspective is always looking for the negative, that which he doesn't have, then you'll always notice it. You'll always notice that which you don't have. It's true. The tile might not be there. And it's true that maybe you have to fix it. That's right. But that shouldn't be the very first thing that you notice. That shouldn't be the very first thing that you see. You just imagine you come back from a chasana, you come back from a charity dinner, whatever it may be, and you're like, oh, the speech was just went on and on forever. And in America, they don't speak by chasanas, do they? Where I come from, they speak by chasanas, right? So, you know, the rabbi goes on and on. That's how it is. You know the famous Misa. Somebody went over to a... Um, Someone who darshan in the chasta, 25 minutes, a bit long for a chasta, you know, be paying by the hour at these halls. 25 minutes, the guy's going on. So they walk up to the guy, somebody walks up to him after the speech, he says, excuse me, that was amazing. What a speech. That was great. I have a radio station. I want you to come and speak in my radio station. He said, wow, that's great, that's amazing. I would love to do that, sure. He said, but I just have one problem. You know, the radio station costs a lot of money. I don't have a slot of 25 minutes. Were you able, would you be able to say exactly what you said tonight in like four minutes? He says, yeah, I think I could do it. So why didn't you? Right? So it's the same thing. When a person goes to a hasana, he doesn't think about the good food, the service, the, music, the type of music, all sorts of things, all the planning that went into it. No, he notes this straight away, the speech. Because unfortunately, when a person doesn't appreciate that which he has, he's never going to be happy, and he's always going to be looking for more. I'll give you an example. Yeah. Going back to the Bikurim, by yeah. the Vars Bikurim, the Gavirim brought it in silver baskets, mm-hmm. and the Aniyim brought it in very cheap little say that. baskets. Say that. But, but even I'm within the Gavirim, even within the Gavirim, the Gavir is there with his big, and he spent a lot of money on the silver bladder. And there he is, he walks in after spending a lot of money, a lot of time in planning what he's going to bring. He sees another Gavir with a better one, with a bigger one. And he says, ha ha, next time I'm going to make sure to up it a little bit more, you know? It's like the same thing with the Esrug. You walk around the Esrug and you see someone with a nicer Esrug than you. So I make sure next year I'm going to get to the guy before this guy gets there. I still put the Aniyam in an inferior position. See, that was a Chazal, a Chazal deal with this issue. But what we're discussing was even within the same class, whether it's Aniyam or the Ashirim, they're always looking at somebody else. Mimela, that's why the Samachta Mechotov is an instruction that a person has to have because the Amasir will be good enough. That's what Gift explains it. I once heard from a major career who owns his own private jet that he can't take the pain that he doesn't own his own yacht. <laughs> there we are. That's Chazal. Always looking for more. Never satisfied with what we have. There's an amazing insight I want to share with you. There's a... We say this every day. It's very interesting. I've, I've spoken this a couple of times and I, it's amazing how sometimes we can say something but yet we don't even realize what we're saying. You know, as the Gemara tells us, sometimes we don't chat. But here's, here's a great example. Maybe, Baruch Hashem, speak it to B'nai Torah, but I've spoken in places where people are like, oh wow, I never thought about that one. Baruch HaShashacha. We say Baruch HaShashacha every single morning. Baruch Hashem, we go through the list of all the wonderful things that Hashem does for us. He opens up our eyes. He enables us to stand up straight. Shoes on our feet. There's so many wonderful things that are in Baruch HaShashachah if we take one moment, perhaps, to think about before we start davening. But I want to concentrate on one particular thing. An amazing thing, because all the brachas are great. 
And we talk have to have a chorus to the Rebbeinu Shalom. The Ani Lafanecha. We appreciate Rebbeinu Shalom. We woke up this morning, and that's an amazing thing. We should never take that for granted. When we open up our eyes and we're able to open our eyes and see and breathe and hear and smell and touch, that, that's just that's unbelievable. It's something that should never be taken for granted. But the list of Berachas Hashachar is amazing, and I want to suggest that there's perhaps one bracha that kind of doesn't fit in, and it's actually the very first bracha that we say. Which Chazal tell us is talking about the rooster. Here's the rooster that differentiates between day and night. Wow. Here we have a list of brachas. And we're thanking the Rabbi Yishon for things that are MS, beautiful. Being able to. Amazing. What's it got to do with the rooster being able to differentiate between night and day? Number one, who cares? Number two, this is number one. This is number one on the list, remember, right? First one on the list. You can imagine the first one on the list, I assume, unless there's some kind of, you know, leading up to the best one right at the end, and it's left in the koyach, but the mice is the first one on the list. This is the most choshev. Number one on the list. And number, th- number three, is it, does it really take a rocket scientist to make the difference between night and day? I mean, you know, a child. Okay, maybe not a baby. They haven't figured it out yet. But once you get a little bit older, they figure the difference out between night and day. So here we are. Wow, the rooster. We thank the Rabbeinu Shalom for the rooster to knowing the difference between day and night. Wonderful. Shkoyach. First one on the list. Berkha Zashacha every single morning. What's Pshat? What's the Gantlis? See, years ago I had a beautiful Pshat. And the Pshat is like this. That it's actually interesting. If you were ever on a kibbutz or wherever you were in, a, in, in a close places to a rooster that was actually making noises at the time of the morning, they don't actually start making the noise during the day. They actually start making the noise already when it's a little bit, it's still dark. Maybe it's getting light, but it's basically dark. And there they are, they're starting to make the noise. Much earlier than Nate, before even Aloy sometimes. You know, what's, so, so where's the night and day? The answer is very simple. The answer is like this. The answer is, that in every darkness, there's always going to be light. And the rooster is able to detect that light within the darkness. The rooster is able to take the night, which is so dark, which is hard, it's cold, and it takes it and it detects when there's a little bit of light within that darkness. On Birchus HaShachar, the very first that we have on the list is this one. Because we have to realize... That when we go through life, there are situations that maybe are perhaps a little bit difficult. There are situations that are perhaps a little bit dark. There are times where life is hard. Life has its challenges. And everybody has those times through their lives. The Rebbe Shalom throws us hurdles to try and jump over. What we have to do, and the very first thing we mention, is to recognize the light within that darkness. <coughs> is to recognize the good that Hashem has given us, without looking at all the bad, without looking at all the, again, quote-unquote bad, to look at everything else and to see the big picture and detect the light pieces that are within it. That's the very first thing on this. You know why? Because everything else on the list is almost obvious. Everything else is there, but even you can see it, it's right there. It's like, can't conform them, it's there. This is something which is so subtle, it's so small, but yet it's so important, it's number one on the list. Who doesn't see Finkel, the Rashiv of the May, that's all, was once sitting with a group of people. He was trying to gain some money from them. Whatever, Gvirim, whatever it was in the world. He was asking for donations. So Nassim Svi Zatzal said, instead of me asking for you for a donation right now, I want to tell you the following Divrei Torah. So he said, Moshe Rabbeinu, it's a, it's a, it's a dead vator, but Moshe Rabbeinu, he said, Rabbi Chaim Briska said it, Rabbi Chaim I'm sorry, he said over the Maisa. And he said that we know we just had the parasha last week, week before, that Moshe Rabbeinu was instructed not to do the first makas in Mitzrayim. What's the reason? Okay, without going into all the details, Moshe Rabbeinu was, for example, saved from the river, from the Nile. Don't smite the Nile to turn it into dumb. Because, Lamaisa, Hakar So, Rabbi Chaim it says, a very posh the thing. Do you think the Nile really knows? <laughs> it's a Nile, it's a river. No shaykhahs to whether it does or it doesn't. Moshe Rabbeinu, come on. You're a human being. You're, you're showing the world, especially Mitzrayim, and also clearly saw the Yad Hashem, the Ramban at the end of Parshish Boy. There's so much. And, and, and you can't hit it because it's a Nile and it helped you. Come on, what's the difference? Elamai, Rebchayim Shem Levitz, learns the side of what our Koresh HaToyver, our showing our appreciation is. It's not about that person. 
It's about us. When we recognize what we have, when we realize what we have, then, then it's an amazing thing. Let me, let me appreciate that which we have. And once we appreciate that which we have, we're much happier. We're much happier people. And therefore, because of that, that's the reason why a person has a chorus at toif. It's like, for example, there was a yid by the coastal. And um, at that time, he came to the coastal, was a, a very wealthy man together with his rov. They came together to the coastal. They came to visit from Chutzlaritz. And the wealthy man together with the rov, they come closer and closer to the coastal. They see, leaning on the wall, a broken, what looks like a broken man. A ter- Mom, it's a terrible situation. The guy's crying his eyes out. Tears are coming out. He's sobbing uncontrollably. And the Gvir turns to the rabbi and says, you know, maybe Nebuch, this guy, who knows what situation he's going through? Who knows what's going on in his life? You know what? Go over to him. He tells the rabbi, go over to him. Ask him, maybe he needs something. I'll, I'll give him a check. I'll help him out. Maybe he's coming into a financial situation. Maybe there's an illness where Haman lives long. Who knows? Go, go, go and ask him what's wrong with him. So the rabbi stands there waiting for him to finish crying. And he finishes crying. The rabbi says, tell me something. Is everything okay? He says, yeah, everything's great, Baruch Hashem, thank you. He said, are you sure? Is there, is there a financial situation? Is there uh, something going on in the family? Maybe I can help you. I know someone who has money. Maybe he can write you a check. He can ease the burden of the finances, whatever. He says, no, everything's great. Everything, uh, why you are, what's the problem? He says, well, we just saw you crying your eyes out. We just saw you completely uh, sobbing uncontrollably. How, why? He said, well, what do you mean? My daughter got engaged last night. It was my 12th daughter. And I'm expressing my koresatoyim to the Rabbi Shalalam for allowing me to marry off all my children. That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. You know, when you see a person in that situation, automatically you assume there's something wrong. No. Here's a person that understood the good that he has. Here's a person that understood all the beauty and all the brachas that the Rabbi Shalom gives him. That's an amazing, amazing thing. There's a Mishnah in Bechayrus. Perik Das, Mishnah Zayn. The Mishnah in Bechayris tells us the procedure, we know this maybe even from Rosh Hashanah, the Mishnah tells us the procedure of taking Misa. How do you take Misa from your animals, right? You've got your newborn animals, you want to take Misa, you've got to give a tent, you've got to give one of the animals out of every ten to the Rabbi Nishalaylam. So how does it work? So again, Chazal tell us, you make a small opening in the gates, and you allow them to pass one by one through, and every tenth one you mark off, and that's come to the Rabbi Nishlalim, and that's wonderful. So you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 gets a mark, and then again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 gets a mark. Very simple. That's the pshat. It doesn't make a difference how many animals you have. You can have 10 animals, you can have 10,000 animals. There is no difference what you have. So it's very interesting. The Beleza Gordon or Shishiva tells, was once collecting money from someone for the yeshiva. So he goes in, and he asks him for a particular large sum of money. And the Gvir says, Rebbe, and I said, I love you, Yeshiva, I love what you're doing, and I'd love to help you, but you're asking me for a fortune of money? I, I, I can't. It's too much for me. So there is a good kid turned to him and said, let me ask the following question. He told him the Chazal that we just mentioned. He said, I don't understand. This is the way to do it. Could there not have been an easier way? Understand. Go and count all the animals. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50. Till you get to 100, let's say. You get to 100, so you know you have 100. You know you have to give 10 away. Take 10, off you go, and finished. It's the business of the small entrance, and they're going one by one through, and then I'm going to tenth one, I'm going to mark, and then start all over again. What's the trap? It's the Gavir, it's the Gavaldi Kakasha, actually. I never thought about that question. I don't know. So Blazer Gordon replied as follows. He said, I want to explain to you. If the Torah would have told somebody with that many animals to go and count your animals and take off 10%, Imagine he has to round together ten animals. Oh, that's a lot. I can't do that. I mean, it's a lot of animals. These animals are a lot of food for me. They're a lot of milk, eggs, food to think. You know, it's all. I can't just do that. It's a lot. Well, what the Torah did, the Torah did something very, very genius. And it's exactly how you saw it. The Torah said, let each animal go in front of you. See what you have first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's mine. Ten. One through a bunch of them. Okay, that I can cope with. And then again, one, two, three. It's the same thing. The moment a person appreciates what he has, the moment a person understands and looks and sees and realizes what he has, so then everything is a whole different picture. His whole life is a different situation. Why? Because he realizes what he has. Once you realize what you have, then it's much easier to give. There was a group 
of geography students in a certain school in America that were asked to uh, write down what they considered to be one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, they were young kids, they didn't exactly study these things, they had no idea much about it. What would be the seven wonders of the world? So, each one gave his answer. This one said the, you know, the, the pyramids, and this one said Mount Everest. You know, each one had their, you know, and Niagara Falls, whatever. Each one had their idea of what would be one of the seven wonders of the world. And there's one particular girl that's having a lot of trouble with finding out and seeing and writing. The teacher came over and said, you know, do you need any help? I see you haven't even written one answer. Everyone else is busy writing and thinking and writing more and whatever. You haven't written one thing. So the girl turns to her and says, you know what, I, I don't know what to write. There, there's so much. She said, give me an example. Give me, give me a couple of ideas that are in your head. We'll try to formulate it. We'll try to put it down to paper. She says, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, the fact that I'm able to move, the fact that I'm able to touch, I'm able to see, I'm able to hear. There's so many wonders of the world. It's an amazing thing from an innocent child who really understands what it means, what it means to have so many things in our life. There was a year that I knew who lived in the area in Ramema where I lived. His name was Bitzak Waldman Satzal. Unbelievable Yid. Hashav Yid. He went through Nebuch, the camps. He had a terrible, terrible life. Terrible, terrible life. He lost a wife. He married another wife that was unfortunately not, not, not normal in a mental way. It was, it, was, it was a terrible situation. But what I always noticed about him, he was a chassid Shayid from Sons. And he was always besimcha. There was always so much happiness. Always with a smile, shepherding the kids with his cane. He was always besimcha, trying to find another joke, trying to find it. It was, it was amazing. So we once asked him, you know, how did you do this? How did you go through life, in the life that you led? And everything that you had, all the experiences in your life, and you're still besimcha, and you're still happy. Give us the recipe. We, we'd also like to learn that. In our small lives, in our small experiences, what we go through, we'd also like to have that. So he said, very simple, it's an amazing answer. He said, listen, if I cry, then nobody's going to cry with me. But if I laugh and I'm happy, then people are happy with me also. And that's your sight. He understood what he has. He understood everything that he has. And once you understand that, you're able to appreciate. There was a principal of a school who had a certain teacher in the school that she wasn't happy with for whatever reason. And it didn't work, wasn't working out with the kids, with the class, with the various chinuch situations that were going on in the school. So, at the end of the year, the principal says, sits down with the teacher and says, listen, you've been a great teacher, we love you very much, but unfortunately it's not working, and we're going to have to let you go. So she gets fired. The teacher comes out, she is completely angry, she's upset, how could you do this to me, especially move to this town for this, for this job, and now I'm stuck with nothing, what am I going to do? Anyway, years, years later, this principal gets a phone call from that teacher. Same teacher. Picks up the phone. Hello. Hi, my name is whatever it is. And the, the principal's like shocked. The teacher says, you're probably shocked to hear from me after all these years. Whatever it is. I just want to tell you what I'm doing right now. I had to move out the area. I was a little bit embarrassed. It was a bit of a shame. I especially moved into the area. I had nothing to do there. I moved out to a different city. And I'm starting to study now how to be a teacher on a much higher level. I'm working on my chinuch skills and everything. And then the principal says, that's very nice. Wonderful. It's very nice to hear. You know, trying to wait till she gets to the punchline. What do you call? So she says, I'll tell you why I'm calling you. Because one of the exercises that we were asked to do on this teacher's training course was to find the person that we hate the most and call them. So I'm calling you to say hello. Right? As you can imagine what the principal felt at that time. So, uh, okay. The principal says, okay, that's great. Uh, thank you. But then she said, hold on a minute. I'm not finished yet. We were then told to write down things that we possibly can admire or look up to or what that person did for us. Write them down. And I did. And I started writing. And as I wrote more and more, it, I realized it dawned on me, you're not so bad. I wrote down that when I came, you welcomed me to the class. You sent into my house a cake. You helped me out with this. You helped me out with that. When I started realizing all the good things that you did, and all the hatred and everything else fell away. Because I realized all the good that you did. And I think very much, this is what's going on over here. What's going on over here in our parasha, what's going on in our own lives, is so many times there are things that go on that maybe don't go our way. There are things that don't happen exactly the way we want them to happen. Not everything works like clockwork. And we have a choice at that moment. What do we do? Do we say, oh, what's going on? What's the Rabbani Shem doing to us? Where is this? I put in my hard work. I put in my money, my effort, my this, that. Or do we say, hold on a second. Look at all the good that we have. 
If a person wants to know the key for a happy life, Simcha Sachayim, the only way that I see over here is to change the mindset but not the environment. I want to just end with one last thing. There was an article written of an old age home and there was a woman writing the article about a particular day that happened in the old age home. And she writes as follows. She said there was a 92-year-old man, 92-year-old man, fully put together, well-dressed, combed his hair, clean-shaven. Amazing sight, amazing thing. His wife of 70 years passed away, which caused the, the, the move to the old age home, to the nursing home, to be a very important thing. He had to do it, he had to go. And uh, fully with it, he was losing his sight slightly, wasn't able to see, and therefore he had to go move into a place they were able to help him. Anyway, so as he maneuvered his walker, we came, we came over to him and said that, uh, Mr. Jones, your room is now ready for you. So he picks up his walker, and he walks slowly over to the elevator, and this lady that's writing saying, I provided him with a description of his room. I knew he couldn't see so well. I wasn't sure how well. So I decided I'm going to explain to him his room as we're walking into the elevator, as we're going up to the third floor to his room. So she starts explaining him, your room, it's a beautiful room. You know, it's got this color carpet. It's got some paintings on the wall. It's got this color. It's got the view from the window is like this. And, you know, the bed is such a way that you're able to go out and go to the bathroom. No, the whole thing. So... The guy says, I love it. I love it. With enthusiasm, like a, like a seven-year-old child, you give him a lollipop. Wow, exciting. And the lady says, Mr. Jones, well, I understand you're excited, but wait till you see the room. You'll like it even more. So he turns to her and says, no, that's not correct. He says, happiness is all in the mind. It's all about the attitude. I've already decided to love the room. It's not about how you arrange the furniture. It's about how you arrange your mind. Rabbi Yisrael, I can leave you with this message. The message, and again, this was a topic that was given to me, which I think is such a chosh of a topic. Simcha sachayim. Simcha in our lives. If we're looking for simcha, if we're looking for happiness, if we're looking to be fulfilled, the way to do it isn't by looking outside of what I can do, what I can achieve, and changing the atmosphere. But it's about changing ourselves, changing our atmosphere, changing our out our mindset, and appreciating, pinpointing, highlighting all the amazing things that the Rabbani Shalom gives us. Appreciating what Hashem gives us. This week we have the Shira. We're able to uh, sing Ozi Yashit, the Rabbani Shalom is a minute to sing Ozi Yashit in Pesukah de Zimmer this week by Shabbos. Why? Because it gives us that once again, we do it by Pesach, we do it again now. It gives us that opportunity to say thank you to the Rabbani Shalom of what we have, where would we be if we were still stuck in Mitzrayim? It's an amazing opportunity that we have. And I think once again, like again, the fact that you have the opportunity to sit here in Eretz Yisrael, Yerushalayim, Yerakodesh, and sit and learn, be in a sugyo, if they ever, beautiful, amazing. And the fact, the fact that I had some schus in being here, trying to give some words of maybe chizuk, whatever it may be, I really hope that I tried, I really hope that you got something, you should have batzlochan, and bracha batzlochan, everything that you do, and everything they have over here, and continue the simcha, all the way for the rest of your lives. Thank you very much. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.